I'm delighted to have you in here this morning. It, it, it fills me with joy and deep appreciation that you would take this time and come in here to join me in studying the minor prophets. And that's what we're going to do. That's the job we've got in front of us. Speaking of job, how many of you remember the very first paying job you ever had? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I do. I delivered newspapers for the Times Union in Rochester, New York. Now, Rochester had two different newspapers at the time. They had the Democrat and Chronicle, which was in the morning, seven days a week. Then they had the Times Union, which was in the afternoon, and it was only Monday through Friday. So it was a great job. I'd come home from school. Papers would be there. I'd put them in my satchel. I'd go out. I'd deliver them. I'd come back. The biggest pain was each week having to go collect the week's subscription from each person. It was 75 cents a week. And I, so I quickly learned how to multiply 75s because if people had two weeks, that was a buck 50. Three weeks is two and a quarter. It just, you, you learn those things real quick. And, and, and I would go and collect and, and it was a good job. I liked that job. I give it a thumbs up. Then we moved. In the middle of seventh grade, we moved from Rochester, New York, to the hub of the Plains, Lubbock, Texas. Not to be confused with Austin as the capital of Texas, but it's a lot, to a lot of people, it's the capital of our hearts. And I got a job delivering that newspaper. That was the Lubbock Avalanche Journal. Now, the Lubbock Avalanche Journal was seven days a week. That means that I had to deliver on Saturday and Sunday. Eh. The Lubbock Avalanche Journal came out in the morning. That means on cold winter school day mornings, when it's raining or snowing, at 4.30 in the morning, I would still have to get up fold my newspapers, and take them and deliver them every day, every day, every day. Now, I got paid. That was a good thing. But on the whole, I'm giving that job a kind of a, eh, all right? <clears throat> Not one of my favorites. Toward ninth, 10th grade, early high school, I gave up the paper route because I got a job at a convenience store. It was called Holiday Mart at the time. It's now been torn down, and this convenience store is in its place. But I would work nine hours a week, and it was a good job. Three hours, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. After school, I'd go there. I'd stock the coolers. I'd make sure all of the product is at the front of the shelves. I'd dust all the products. I tried, mom sent me a, a big sign the other day that said, uh, I dusted the house last week. The dust came back. I'm not falling for that anymore. <laughs> um, uh, it, was, it was that kind of a thing. You dust, and, and I did learn to start at the top and dust down. Otherwise, you dust the bottom shelf, and then you dust the top shelf, and it just all goes down to the bottom. But it was a good job, and it was a job where I, I progressed and got to work at the cash register eventually and, and basically got to open the stores on weekend, on Saturdays, not on Sunday, but uh, uh, on Saturdays, and, and, and I liked that job ultimately. That was a good job. It taught me how to talk to people and some people skills. It taught me to, how to manipulate people, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, and by that I mean... Uh, uh, Joe Stapleton, the store owner, understood that the bread and the milk go in the back corners so that people have to pass everything to go get the bread and the milk because that's what they come in for. But then on the way as they're walking past, if you have things at eye level, it'll catch their eye and they may want to buy it. If you put it the, the checkout line, things that people can readily handle and buy that will grab their interest, and that's why they buy them. That you put Campbell's tomato soup or chicken noodle soup down at the bottom because that's what people need and they'll reach for it. But, you know, cream of giraffe soup or whatever you, you, you put up at eye level or they'd never buy it. Um, 
or maybe it's giraffe and rice. I don't remember what the soup was. But I liked that job. That was a really good job for me. And I kept that job on into early college. I think my next real paying job after Holiday Mart was the summer where I worked at the League City Church of Christ. And I got to preach every other Sunday night, and I got to teach on Wednesdays, and, and I was a, a, a preacher in training, for lack of a better way of saying it. And I just loved that job. That was the greatest thing in the world. But that is where I preached a sermon on Jonah that I thought was so good until I realized the entire sermon I'd called him Noah. I mean, the entire sermon. I'm talking about Noah and the big fish and Noah trying to flee from God. And it was, it, 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 it was an emotionally traumatic moment because at the end, you know, here I am. I'm just this kid who wants to be a preacher, and, and I'm trying so hard, and I'd worked so hard on that sermon. And afterwards, you know, all of the, the, the encouragers in the church, which generally means the older ladies, they would come up to me after I would preach and always tell me I did such a good job. And this time, they all, and, and so afterwards, I'm, I'm hoping to get some encouragement because I've worked so hard on the sermon, and I have no clue what I've done. I think I've just preached this magnificent sermon on Jonah, and, and all of the ladies come up, and one at a time, they say to me, you did so good. Did you know you called Jonah Noah the whole time? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. Um, through law school, I worked at an apartment complex and managed an apartment complex. That was kind of cool. I kind of liked that job. I got out of law school, and I took a job at a huge law firm here, a huge law firm in Houston. I mean, like, it's, in, it's all over the world now. I think at the time I was there, I was lawyer number 888 or something. Uh, I mean... It was massive, and at first I started work there, and, and it, it was miserable. I don't know how else to say it. It was absolutely miserable. The, the, the hours, you know, we, it was kind of funny. We were expected as young lawyers to, if we wanted to succeed, we had to stay there longer than any of the partners. You needed to get there before the partners, and you needed to stay till the partners left. And there was a Friday evening where uh, another associate and I, Bob Mace was his name, Bob and I both had commitments Friday evening for dinner parties with our family and, and friends. And so we were like commiserating, how are we going to get out of here? We got to leave by 6 p.m. And not all the partners would leave by 6 p.m., even though it was a Friday, because some of them had no life. And so... <laughs> We're, we're, we're just sweating it, right? So finally, we just said, okay, at 6 p.m., we're going to go together. We're going to get to the elevator bank, and we're going to look to see if anybody's there. And if nobody's there, we're going to go out, we're going to punch the down button, and then we're going to step away. And then when the elevator comes, we're going to kind of see if anybody's in there. And if there's not, we're going to get on. So it's 6 p.m. We meet outside the elevator bank. We press. Elevator shows up. We're on the eighth floor of the old bank of the Southwest building. Elevator doors open. All clear. We get in. Elevator doors close. We punch G for ground. Eighth floor, ding, and we stop at the seventh floor, and the head of the entire firm of litigation steps onto the elevator looking at us. Bob Mace, bless his heart, does not miss a beat at 6 p.m. at night as he looks at me and says, so Lanier, where do you want to eat lunch? Like, man, we're just finally getting to go to lunch. Uh, over time, you make your way through, the job gets better, and I'm kind of liking it. And I got to tell you, by the time I was through there the last few years, I had grown to really love my job. I loved the people I worked with. I loved what I was doing. I felt like I was, was uh, uh, in, a, in a great place, in a great field that was really good. I don't know how many of you have ever left one job and went to a new one. How many of you have had more than one? Okay, everybody has. You know, and, and, and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing depends upon how you see the job. Well, we're going to talk about that today with Jonah because we're going to divide this up and I want today to look at Jonah's old job 
Then I want to look at Jonah's new job. And then we're going to discuss the fallout that happens as we look at these two different jobs. So to do that, we got to go to our shelves. Let's pull off Jonah. Let's open it up. And let's see what Jonah has to say. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, the son of Amittai, saying. Now, the Jonah, the son of Amittai, we actually know about him. We can read about him in other parts of the Bible. We could do a LinkedIn page for Jonah. Jonah, I said that right. If I say Noah, James, you're in charge of like getting my attention. And, and everybody else, including on the internet, y'all are in charge of what's called a global replace. You need to, every time I say Noah, just stick the word Jonah in there. We'll be doing fine because Noah should not be in this lesson at all. He's been dead and gone for a long time, okay? If you go to Jonah's LinkedIn page, Jonah, son of Amittai, or Ben uh, is the Hebrew word for son, is from Gath Hefer. And his job is to provide critical insight to King Jeroboam II. That's what he does. Now, I want to put this into historical context for everybody, so we're going to go back. I'm a late Exodus guy, so I think it's around 1250 that Moses takes the Israelites out of the Promised Land, and they wander around in the wilderness for about 40 years or so before they finally get to go into the Promised Land. They go into the Promised Land around 1210, and they start conquering it, and for the first couple hundred years almost, they are basically ruled by judges, which means not really ruled at all. They've got community ruling. They've got, uh, um, they're, they're settled by their tribes. And so they've got the family units uh, uh, within the tribes and the clans. And, and they're handling things on their own. But finally, they reach a point where they want a king like everybody else has. They want to change their form of government. And so around 1250, uh, uh, I mean around 1050, after 100 plus years, almost 200 years, we, they get King Saul. That's a picture of him chunking a spear at David, which he did quite often. Um, they get King Saul. And they picked Saul because he was handsome and tall, which is never supposed to be your criteria for picking your leaders, okay? Okay. There are studies that show that we tend to give greater credibility to people who are handsome or pretty. And these are not like one-off studies. There are a lot of studies that show we increase the credibility of someone based upon what they look like or decrease it based upon what they look like. It was no different 3,000 years ago. Saul was a handsome dude. And he was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. And that's why Israel picked him as king. But he was not a godly king. And so while he started reigning in 1050, by the time 1010 comes along, David has replaced him as king. And David was a man after God's own heart. And David was not perfect. And David made a lot of mistakes. And David knew how to repent from his mistakes. And David walked before the Lord, not without tragedy, not without difficulty, but he walked before the Lord in the pleasure of the Lord. And so David reigns until about 970 when he's replaced after his death by his son Solomon, who builds the temple. So this is where Israel reaches its zenith in terms of its uh, possessions, in terms of its land, in terms of its prosperity. <clears throat> But when Solomon dies, there is a division that happens within Israel. And Israel divides into two kingdoms. So you've got the northern kingdom of Israel, which also is called Samaria, because ultimately that's where the capital is placed. And then you've got the southern kingdom of Judah, which includes Jerusalem, and that's where um, uh, uh, that, those were David's people. That's where his progeny stemmed from, and, and it sticks around a lot longer. 
So you've got this division, and that means you've got different kings in each group. And Israel's got an interesting set of kings. The first one in the divided kingdom is Jeroboam. And Jeroboam reigns for a decent while. He's not a, he's not a great king, but he's an okay king, and he reigns. And when he dies, his son Nadab takes the throne. Nadab's evil. Does evil before the Lord. Jeroboam did evil before the Lord too. But Nadab's really bad. And so Nadab, his son, reigns until he gets killed by Baasha, who then becomes the king. And there's a coup. Baasha is the king. He stays king. When he dies, his son Elah becomes king. His son Elah becomes king until the commander of the army kills him on purpose in a coup. His name was Zimri, and Zimri becomes the king. Now, Zimri is king for a while. Zimri reaches a point where he doesn't want to, the people don't want Zimri as a king. He's going to die in in a civil war. So instead, he just goes home to the king's house and burns it down all around him and he commits suicide. And so when he does that, a new king comes in, Omri, who was the head of the army at the time. And Omri comes in and he's the new king. And Omri's uh, going at it. When Omri dies, he's succeeded by Ahab. By the way, if we want to talk about whether these are good kings or bad kings, evil, 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 evil. He dies, King Ahab, evil. Ahab, you'll remember a lot of biblical stories about, perhaps. If it helps you place him in your brain, He married a foreign woman named Jezebel. And there's a reason Jezebel has fallen out of favor as a name for children these days. (laughs) Ahab dies. His son Ahaziah takes the throne. Ahaziah uh, dies. He doesn't have a son. So his brother Joram takes the throne. Joram's on the throne, and um, nah, doesn't work. Family's dead, kills off, because Jehu becomes the new king. And Jehu is actually not that bad a king. He's not great, but he's not that bad. God told him to destroy everybody from Ahab's family, and he does. And he follows what God tells him to do. Now, he still has some idle problems and things like that. But Jehu's not that bad. Now, Jehu dies, and he is succeeded by his son Jehoahaz, who is a horribly evil king. Absolutely wretched. Jehoahaz dies, and he's succeeded by Jehoash, another wretched evil king. Jehoash dies, and he's succeeded by a fellow who takes the name Jeroboam II. They didn't call him the second. We do. They just called him Jeroboam, but we don't want to be confused, so we call him Jeroboam the second. Jeroboam the second is an evil king. Here's your passage. We are, by the way, 793 B.C. at this point. Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, and he reigned 41 years And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, Jeroboam does what's evil in the sight of the Lord. During Omri, Ahab, Ahaziah, Joram, Jehu, and Jehoahaz, during that period of kings, those were spoken to by the prophets of Elijah and Elisha. And so those prophets were the ones who, who dealt with them. And, and Elijah and Elisha, you'll remember the stories of them. I don't need to remind you. But 793, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, begins to reign. And he does evil in the sight of the Lord, but he's a successful king in the eyes of the world. Evil in the eyes of the Lord, successful in the eyes of the Lord. I mean, world. He restored the border of Israel 
from Lebo Hamath, as far as the Sea of the Arabah, that's the Dead Sea, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amatai, the prophet who was from Gath Hefer. So Jonah got a job. He's the prophet, counselor, insight giver to the king. The king's evil in the sight of the Lord, but he's pretty worldly successful. With Jonah's good advice and counsel, the king is expanding the territories of Israel. And so he takes Israel, he expands it north, he expands it south, and this is Jonah's job. Jonah's job is to give this king great advice. The advice doesn't seem to be of the moral nature. It seems to be of the worldly political nature. But Jonah likes his job. I mean, come on. That's pretty close to power. Being the confidant of the king who's helping lead him to victory. And what happens? He gets a new job. See, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, you got a new job. Arise. Now, that doesn't mean the word of the Lord came to him while he's sleeping. It means, come on, get your clothes on, get yourself ready. Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city. And call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Well, evil's coming up from the king of Israel. And Jonah hadn't been doing diddly squat that we can read about on that. Doesn't seem to quite be his issue. But it's his new job. Now, to understand his new job, let's understand Nineveh a little bit. This is the story of the Assyrian Empire in part. Here we've got Israel. The Assyrian Empire is, is got three at this point probably capital cities, and one of them is Nineveh. Nineveh is on the northern of the Tigris-Euphrates of the Fertile Crescent. It's on the northern river. All right? So this whole area, ultimately around the time of Jonah, right before, no, I should say before the time of Jonah, is the Assyrian Empire. You've got the Egyptian Empire down here. So you've got Assyria massive, e Egypt massive, eh, wilderness, desert, who gives a rip, and these small little countries. If you're watching this and you're in the wilderness on Sinai Peninsula and you give a rip, I didn't mean that offensively. But you can go back less than 100 years, and in 841, King Jehu, who started this lineage of kings, was having to pay tribute to the Assyrian king, Shalmaneser. Because the Assyrian empire reached all the way down and even had its fingers into Israel. So King Jehu, the great-grandfather of Jeroboam II, had been having to pay tribute to the king of Assyria. So if you recognize that all of these kings were scared of Assyria through all of that prophet time, you've got an understanding of the history that goes behind this. Now, at the time of Jonah, things have weakened for the Assyrian Empire. So by, the, I mean, so by the time you get to Jeroboam II, the Assyrian Empire has been subject to plagues, rebellion. We know from, we've got records from, Nineveh had an incredible library. And it was discovered at the end of the 1800s. And we've got massive numbers of tablets. Many of them haven't even been translated yet from the Nineveh Library. But we know without any doubt that there were at least two major plagues that really affected the population. There was rebellion under a prior king that, that where his son rebelled and, and Babylon to the southeast 
assisted in the rebellion. And what ultimately happened was the Assyrian Empire was weakening and constricting. And so at the time of, of Jonah, Assyria, it's still a major empire. You don't want to tick these people off. But it no longer has the influence that it had over Israel. And I'm sure Israel doesn't want to get on its radar screen. I'm sure Israel does not want to provoke the king of Nineveh or the king of Assyria to take his army and go down and deal with the pesky Israelites. Now, Nineveh was still an incredible city. And I want to show you a video that's been put together of what it might have looked like. Now, this is shortly after Jonah. This is an estimation of what it looked like somewhere within 100 years of Jonah, 668 to 627. Here it gives you an idea of what Nineveh would have looked like with a computer, sorry, trying to get out of y'all's way, a computer re, whatever you'd call this. What would you call this? Yeah, that thing. See, it's on the river. And it's a pretty awesome city. I'm not going to take the time to go through the rest of the video. You can grab this off YouTube if you want to. But it's an amazing, amazing video. Here's a drawing of what Nineveh would have looked like at the time of Jonah based upon Henry Layard was the archaeologist who excavated Nineveh in the late 1800s. And he did this. Um, uh, he did this. I, 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 you know, that, that's, you look at it and it's all nice and clean and pretty. And I've never seen a city so nice and clean and pretty. And, you know, like people get dressed up like that to go boating on a Sunday afternoon, you know, and, oh, gee, let's sit out here with our goats. It's doctored up, okay? This is an idealist view. But it gives you an idea of the magnitude and grandeur. So here's the job that Jonah's been told is his new job. you got to leave the cushy confines of giving counsel to your buddy the king who's doing politically well even if he's morally corrupt. And you've got to go to Nineveh, the city, one of the capital cities of one of your biggest enemies who had subjected you to paying taxes and tribute to them as recently as the king's great-grandfather. And you're to go up there and to provoke them with the message of the Lord. Now, if that's not enough to make you not really want to do the job, can I add that you'll be walking to get there? And it's basically the same as me saying, hey, if you guys aren't busy, would you like to join me? And let's walk up to Kansas, Wichita, perhaps? Because that's how far they would have to walk. About 650 miles. I don't like to walk from here to my car after church. <laughs> oh, let me add some more. When you get there, you're going to see on the reliefs the kind of stuff that the military for Assyria does to their enemies. Because here's a wonderful relief. It's been removed from, from uh, Nineveh, and it's, I think uh, uh, you can still see it right now in the London Museum, British Museum in London. But these are... Assyrian soldiers. These are heads of their enemies that they're holding by the hair. But the heads have no bodies, as in decapitated. You say, wow, that's kind of rough. Well, how about this? This, they're playing catch with one of the heads. Whoops, dropped that one. Yeah, go on up there. Walk up there. Walk 650 miles and go tell them you've got a message from the Lord. And oh, by the way, 
you're from that little mountain kingdom that they've probably forgotten about because you're not too big, but hey, you're going up there, go do it. And let me make this matter even worse for you in terms of what the new job would be for Jonah. Jonah knew what God had said with the original King Jeroboam. Now, Jonah's tight with King Jeroboam II, but the original Jeroboam was told, the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water and root up Israel out of this good land that he gave to their fathers and scatter them beyond the Euphrates. Well, let's see, that would be Nineveh. Because they have made their Asherim provoking the Lord to anger. So for a couple of hundred years, this prophecy has been hanging over Israel. That God is going to destroy them and uproot them from their land and ship them off to the Assyrian Empire. And the prophecies didn't end there. Because that prophecy came under Jeroboam the first. But by the time you get over here to Jehu, whoops, let me go back. To Jehu, there's a more specific prophecy. The prophecy to Jehu, the Lord said, because you've done well in carrying out what's right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. Your sons of the fourth generation, Jehoahaz one, Jehoash two, Jeroboam three, unless you count Jehu. If you count Jehu, Jeroboam the second is the fourth generation. If you don't count him, he's the third. Now I'm reading this as a lawyer. As a lawyer, I'm thinking, I don't count him. Sons to the fourth generation. But there is some ambiguity there. Maybe I'm wrong. I'll guarantee you Jonah's sitting there thinking, well, I wish I knew. But do I really want to be the fella to, to take my buddy and fulfill the old prophecy by going up and provoking the Assyrians? Or if not, I, prov I don't provoke them. And God has mercy on them. And then they've got the power to come back. Because you know God. I'll, I'll go up there and preach repentance. They'll repent. I don't want that. This is not my job. I like my job. I like my old job. It was a good job. It is a good job. I don't like my new job. I don't want to do it. No. Which brings us to the fallout. So Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, that's modern day Jaffa, uh, the port city in Israel, to Jaffa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He decides, hey, I'm going to go to Tarshish. Now I think you may know this, many of you, but let's be real clear. Nineveh, Tarshish. Go to Nineveh, new job. Don't want new job. Going as far away as I can get on a boat. Maybe there there'll be another boat that'll take me up to London. So he goes to Tarshish. But here's the key. To flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. From the presence of the Lord. This Hebrew letter M means from. This Hebrew letter L means before or to, but here it's before. And this Hebrew word, pana, it's pana in that form, means face. 
You can say it means presence, and that's fine. That's what it's talking about, panea. It means uh, the face, the front, the presence. So he wants to get away from the presence of God, the face of God. Find God, I quit. Okay, I'll leave my old job, but I ain't going to the new job. I quit. I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. Have a good day and find somebody else. That, uh, that's the scene, that's the stage that is set for the short book of Jonah. Now, I want to go over some stuff, but I'm calling these the points for home because they really are, but it's the thrust of what I want us to get out of here at this point with these verses. You know, in a very real sense for all believers, life itself is a job. I started this class out talking about my paying jobs. I didn't list for you my unpaying jobs. My unpaying jobs go way back before the Times Union paper route. I had to clean up my room. I had to, my sister Catherine and I had to do the dishes one night a week, which we thought was a sign of the meanest parents <laughs> there could ever be. I mean, if I had to do them one day a week, and Catherine had to do them one day a week, and Holly was too young, so I got to do them one day, that, that's two days a week after dinner that mom doesn't have to do the dishes, and dad doesn't have to do the dishes because of child labor. So Catherine and I kind of bonded together, and we quickly realized that on my day, she'd help me, and on her day, I'd help her. And it never occurred to us <laughs> that we were being taught responsibility. We were being taught how to do dishes without cracking the glass and cutting your finger off. We were being taught how to, to do things in a responsible manner, and we were contributing to the household of which we were leeches. But life is a job, not just growing up, not just as an adult where, where you've got life as a job, but before God. God's got work for you to do. Ergos is the Greek word for work. And when Paul writes in Ephesians 2 about our salvation, he says that we're saved for the purpose of good works that God prepared beforehand for us to walk in them. Our tendency is to read these stories about Jonah or read stories about Abraham or read stories about David and think that God had very special things for them or Paul or, or Peter or whatever to do, but we're just normal Christians. There's not such a thing as a normal Christian. God has something for everybody to do. If God does not have something for you to do, you'll know it because you'll be dead. But if you are alive, God has something for you to do. Life is work. And the stunning part is, don't want to disappoint you here, but when we're dead and judgment comes, the promise of Scripture is that God's going to remake heaven and earth. And we will be alive eternally doing our jobs, whatever they may be. I can remember as a kid just getting real bummed about heaven. I thought, you know, heaven's just, you go off this place and all you do is sing. And I love to sing, but after a couple hours, I was afraid it was going to get to me. Or what about days? What about years? Eternity? Just singing? I hope they got a lot of new songs. I mean, doesn't, doesn't that, no, that's, 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 um, that's not the biblical view of what our life is like. We're not just some floating spirit in the ether for the eternity praising God in worship. We praise God in worship when we work, when we do the things He's made us to do. 
When we accomplish, he made us and we were good. And before the sin and the fall, we were human beings with flesh and blood. And that's the eternal life. He will make us live eternally in a physical way that includes the spiritual in service to him. So life's a job. It's, it's a job now. It's a job before God. And the question for me is, do I want to flee the presence of God, the face of God in my life? No. No, the biblical calling is, is not that. Hey, you can't do that successfully anyway. Didn't work for Jonah, spoiler alert. I mean, look at Psalm 139, verse 7, and I think I've got verse 8 up there as well, but it goes on and on. Where shall I go to, from your spirit? Where shall I free from your presence? Panea, your, 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 your presence, same word. If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I go to Sheol, you're there. That's the afterlife. If I go to the farthest corners of the sea, you're there. You're in Tarshish. You're in the boat on the way to Tarshish. Yeah, we, how you can't get away from God. Nobody can successfully run from God. You can't just quit and have God ignore you. The presence of God, the face of God, is not only something you cannot avoid, but it's something that you want to experience more and more and more. You want to bask in it. You want it to shine upon you. You want it to radiate out into your life. The ironic blessing, the blessing that God wrote for Israel to pronounce, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face, His presence, same word, His face shine upon you. And be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance, same word as face, upon you and give you peace. We, we need to be seeking the presence of God to shine into our life, to give meaning to our work, to define who we are, to show the shadows and the darkness in life and reveal them for what they are so we can run from them, so we can, 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 can be repelled by them. We want God to shine. We want his presence. That's the way we're supposed to be living. Jonah shouldn't be trying to flee the presence of God. He should be invoking the presence of God to shine upon his job going to Nineveh. But he should have been seeking it to shine on his job with the king of Israel as well. We need to seek God's presence to shine on each other. To radiate upon us. To transform us. And how do we do that? Well, there are lots of ways. Lots of ways. But here's my suggestion. Psalm 95 verse 2. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. One of the ways that, that we come into the presence of God should be with singing, with thanksgiving. Say, yeah, 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 that's real good. No, no, no. Stop for a moment. Take this more literally than you are. Make a decision in the jobs you're doing today, whether it's jobs for pay, jobs for home, or jobs for God, which hopefully everything is, but make a mental decision to be thankful to God for what you're about. Don't say, I don't like this job, God, and I'm miserable and I'm quitting it, unless God wants you to quit it. If he wants you to quit it, then you can't quit fast enough. You do it when he says I mean, that's the overriding concern. 
If God's not behind what you're doing, then change what you're doing. But if you're doing something with God behind it, you need to be thankful to God. If you, I've got Steve Taylor sitting here on the front row. Steve and I have worked together in, in litigation matters for 15 years, 20 years. I don't know how long. It seems forever. And, and we both know that there are cases you get involved in where I'm just like, I hate this. I don't want to be here. And I'm grumbling and I'm complaining. And that's just the wrong attitude to have. And I just need to, to listen to the story of Jonah and seek the presence of God in what I'm doing. And if I'm doing a case where God doesn't want me to do it, I just need to quit and leave. But if I'm doing it and God wants me to do it, then why on earth am I belly aching about it? If you've got a life and you've got a family commitment and you're doing it the way God wants you to, don't bellyache about it, even if it's doing the dishes once a week. Be thankful. Be thankful to God. That's a deliberate, God, thank you for this. It's not the kind of thing I'd want. Wouldn't be what I'd pick. But if this is your will for me, then thank you and may, may your presence shine upon me while I'm doing it. And then make a joyful noise. That means you don't just say, thank you, God, and then go back to sulking. That means you say, thank you, God, and you begin singing some joyful song to the Lord. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. To stay. But, but you know, this is, this is a recognition that we need to do these things. By the way, spoiler alert, Assyria does come conquer Israel. Uh, that fourth generation thing, it's the son of, of Jeroboam II who gets conquered. But you want to be in the presence of God. You want it to shine upon you. And you want to do it with songs of praise. Or look at this psalm. Psalm, uh, I think I put Psalm 100 up here. Yeah. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. See that serve the Lord? Serve the Lord. That's who you're working for. You do your work for the Lord. And you're coming into his presence with singing. You're not trying to flee his presence, even if it's not the job you would pick. And this is something that takes us into worship. And this is something that needs to lead us into next week because I want to give you a preview for a moment. Jonah, uh, one of our class uh, members is uh, reading Jonah right now in a Hebrew class. And, uh, in fact, she brought me the sheet uh, that they had as a handout for the first three verses. Jonah is, is a great, great book to read in Hebrew because it's not hard. It's, it's pretty simple. It's got good basic grammar, so it reinforces good basic grammar. But it's got really cool stuff that lights your fire. It's got some incredible wordplay. It's got some incredible theology. And remember, it's referenced by Jesus and, I believe, by Paul. All of that's what I want to get into next week. And so next week, we're going to digest. Now, some of you are going to come up to me and you're going to say, Mark, do you believe it was a literal fish? Or do you believe that this is an allegory? Because we would like to know. Some of you are going to say, we go fishing a lot, and we'd like to get an idea if there's a danger out there. (laughs) If it had been my dad, if my dad had been Jonah, my dad would have claimed he caught that fish. He just couldn't reel it in. Um, You know, some people take fishing very seriously. And, And if you want an answer to that from my perspective, come back next week. But I'm also just going to tell you, That's not the point of the story. 
This story is not to teach us about the precarious dangers of the sea. And so, could God miraculously make a fish that could swallow him? Sure, there are fish who could swallow him already. Could God keep him alive for three days? That's a whole other issue for God to do, but that's the miracle. But we can talk about that next week. This week, we're going to put it back on the shelf. I'd urge you to read Jonah before we come back next week. Be looking for wordplay that you may pick up, and then, uh, uh, then we'll start looking at that next week in detail. But for now, we got more work to do. We get to go worship and sing praise to God. So let me bless you in the name of Jesus, and then uh, I'll see you next week, God willing. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray your presence to shine upon us. That you would be gracious to, you, to us. That you would make your face shine upon us. That your presence would give us peace, shalom, peace. As we look at this life and we look at our jobs and the things we have to do and, and the, way, the, 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 the things on our agenda today, those that we know about and those that are going to totally surprise us, may we always seek your presence in what we're about and do it to your glory with gratitude in our hearts and a song on our lips. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. Amen.